On January 20th, We Can't Wait New Orleans organized a protest to demand real action around the economic crisis that millions of workers are facing. The demands were around this call to action. What follows is a Zoom meeting that was held to discuss Biden's economic plans. Let's start with the uh, basics of uh, the money that he's talking about. Here is Biden's economic plans. Viewers can pause this video and read it at their leisure. This is far more than, certainly than I expected. And I think uh, many, many other people expected. Some, in fact, are uh, comparing it to, uh, to the New Deal, which is a great exaggeration. Um, but it just goes to show you know, how much more it, it is than what was expected. And I think that there's a couple of reasons for it. One is all the protests that have happened in the last six months to a year. There's been, what, a couple of hundred strikes. There's been uh, the Black Lives Matter and the Black Lives Matter movement. And also the other thing, I do think that the uh, attempted lynch mob on January 6th uh, was a really shocking event for a lot of the politicians and for um, the capitalist class in general. And they realized they got to do something to try to stabilize the situation. Now, having said that, we we'll also have to have a uh, critical view and see where this program, although it's more than a lot of us expected, see where it falls short. And we should remember as far for in the first place that the supplemental unemployment pay, it was $600 a week. Then it was cut back down to 300. And now Biden is proposing to raise it. No, to no, excuse me. Uh, point of order, John. Yes. The uh, unemployment, enhanced unemployment, was eliminated totally. Right. But that's right. It August. was eliminated totally, so, but under the bill, July. excuse so, me, right. But, but what I'm saying, under the bill that was passed in December, then it was, uh, it was $300. And 300. so, yes. Right. And now he's raising it to 400 And this is an absolutely classic game that the Democrats pay. A play is where the Republicans talk about attacking wages, let's say by 50% of the Republicans talk about cutting wages, let's say by 50% and the Democrats say, oh, no, 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 no. Under no conditions should you cut it by 50%. You can only cut it by a third. And in fact, that's what happened with, with this. Now also to put it in perspective, that $440 billion in aid for state and local governments. State and local governments are already in debt, uh, something to the tune of something between two and seven trillion dollars. And um, the, the, their decline in revenue due to COVID has been close to 500 billion. So that's not adequate to make up for what the, uh, the crisis that state and local governments are facing. Now I want to make a comment. So, um, we should really uh, seriously look at what that $15 an hour minimum wage, what it really means. And we should remember that it was first popularized about seven years ago. And even at that time, it was inadequate. And anyway, um, the, Biden, has, he's proposed it, but there's no timetable for it. So let's look at what that means. It would mean if you work a 40 hour week and the average number of work days in a month is 22, it would mean you'd be making $2,640 a month. Now let's look at that as far as housing. And keep in mind that they figure that affordable housing means no more paying no more than one third of your monthly income. Now, Given that 50, 52% of New, uh, New Orleans households are renter occupied, I would guess that the overwhelming majority of workers, and especially those near the bottom of the pay scale, um, are renters, not, not homeowners. So let's look at rents in, in New Orleans. 
the average rent in December of last year, that is just a month ago, the average rent for a one bedroom uh, uh, apartment was one fourth, $1,471 a month. And for a two bedroom, it was $2,059 a month. So that means that if you're making $15 an hour for a one for the average one bedroom apartment, you'd be paying 56% of your monthly rent, of your monthly income. And now let's say you're a single parent with one child or two children, and you have to have two bedrooms. In that case, for the average, you'd be paying 78% of your monthly income. So you can see that $15 an hour, even if it were passed tomorrow, is totally inadequate for the average New Orleans worker. Um, and incidentally, I was reading that the uh, poverty level in New Orleans is 27% of the population, which is over twice the national average. Now, even having said that, when you look at Biden's total um, uh, relief package, I think that the chances for it to pass in whole are very, very, very low. Um, right. And even, even, and especially on that issue of the minimum wage, because even if, uh, um, well, you'd have to have every single Democrat vote for it. And you already have one of them, uh, uh, I think his first name is Joe Manchin, the, the uh, right. senator from West, West Virginia, Virginia, who has already said that he opposes many parts of it. And in particular, you know that he's going to oppose the minimum wage proposal. So that in itself will be severely watered down, if not killed outright. Now, regarding the COVID relief itself, it seems like there will be a speeding up of availability of the vaccines. And in fact, it already has been sped up, at least I'm seeing that here in my area. And uh, uh, Biden will be encouraging social distancing and uh, use of masks. But there's two problems with that. First of all, Trump has left what you could call a poison chalice in the form of the hysteria regarding masks. Also, it's linked with the hysteria and, and, uh, and, and also as far as uh, closing of businesses and, and uh, social distancing. And also it's linked with this, this will be linked with this hysteria that Biden was not legitimately elected. So it'll be extremely difficult for him to persuade huge sectors of the population to follow minimal um, uh, safety practices. Now, the second problem is, and this is in some ways far more important, and this is an issue that almost never gets discussed, even amongst socialists, never mind within the wider working class. And that is, why is it that we have seen a tremendous acceleration in, uh, in the development of new diseases that have jumped from other animals to the human species? That's called zoonotic uh, diseases. That's a word that I just learned myself just a few months ago, but I think that every worker should um, know that word. And the reason is the uh, overwhelming use of an, one of industrial farming and two wild habitat destruction. And you know, I don't, there's not enough time to discuss how that uh, uh, is linked to this, but that has basically opened the door to the, uh, to the evolution of one virus after another. And there's this uh, scientist, Rob Wallace, who's written extensively about that. And what he's explained is, you know, actually uh, uh, COVID, we've been in a way fortunate in that its actual mortality rate is quite low. It's only about 1%. And the reason that it's killed so many people is just that it's spread extremely easily. But other diseases are waiting in the wings. He says it's not if, it's when, it's when. And just imagine <clears throat> there's a, a, the virus, the Nipah virus, which, kills, which has a mortality rate of something like 30 to 
but it's not very easily spread. In fact, I'm not sure if it can even, even be spread from one human to another. But imagine if that virus had a mutation and was it, uh, uh, spread as easily as the COVID virus. And that sort of thing, if these practices um, uh, continue, then that sort of thing is just a matter of time. And so while we talk about the COVID relief and safe practices, vaccines and all of that, that's well and good and we have to talk about that, but we also have to impress on people these other, uh, uh, this, this other and, and deeper issue. Now, just in conclusion, I'd like to make one final point, And that is that ever since the Civil War, the US capitalist class has basically shifted back and forth. It's balanced back and forth between its two big parties, the Republican and Democratic parties. That's uh, uh, an important part of how it's been able to maintain stability and maintain its rule in a fairly stable way in the United States. And now one of those two parties, the Republican Party, is in extreme crisis. And you can think of it like an equation with two sides being equal. Now, if one side starts to crumble, then the entire equation is out of balance and starts to collapse. And a key in the equation, in my view, is that unlike, for instance, in Europe and also some other countries like Brazil, there's never been a mass working class party in this country. And so um, the key question I think that we have to think about is how can a working class party start to develop? And with this crumbling of this old system of rule, I think that that, that opens up all sorts of possibilities. I just want to conclude by saying, I saw uh, the, the uh, campaign for office of your comrade there, uh, Nooning, and mm -hmm. I think that it, part of the, uh, um, what can be an important part of the development of a working class party is individual candidates like that, that start to explain that their campaign is all about building an independent workers movement and uh, an independent working class party. So let's open up the floor to comments. Who'd like to make a comment? Well, yeah, uh, John, I'd like to make, there is the Working Families Party, a, a recent uh, uh, party that started within the last three or four years. And then the Labor Party has been around for a long time. Uh, so they're, but they're very small, I guess. Are you familiar with those two parties? Y yes, uh, maybe uh, uh, I'll take some notes and maybe other people will comment and, and then I'll- Okay, all right, that sounds I'll, good. I'll, I'll come back, yeah. Yeah, I'd like okay. to make a comment or question or comment. Yeah, I mean. Okay, Jay, what's your question? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I you know, yeah, of course, it, we're socialists. We'd like this to go a lot farther, but uh, I, I agree with John that it's, you know, what as good as we could have expected from, uh, from Biden, but uh, yeah, the question is getting it through, and I, I don't see it. Even if they do, first of all, he's putting out a, uh, a an olive branch to the Republicans, and that's going to go nowhere. Now, it appears they, they will, and Sanders has indicated as much, that they're going to go to reconciliation, which is kind of a weird word because it's the opposite of reconciliation just you know cutting a deal with the house who the democrats control but i think you're right there's mansion and he's part of a whole layer of more right-wing democrats who are going to block this or water it down uh, immensely so i don't think it's going to get through at all unless we put up a fight you know i i just don't i don't see it selling uh selling through so I, I'd like to get your perspective uh, on the fight that's going to have to, you know, take place. And I, I just want to echo your comments about the crisis of state and local governments. I, I mean, I don't think this has been discussed enough among the left. There's going to be, there's already been huge layoffs, but there's going to be massively more 
Um, and I think they're waiting right now for if this is going to go through. Uh, and if not, there's going to be a bloodbath. At, at, and that's talk about, you know, Black Lives Matter. Black, the black working class will be particularly hard hit because they're higher, have a higher percentage in the public sector and particularly fiscally, um, fiscally uh, challenged municipalities like New Orleans, Newark, and, and many others. Okay, um, I'd like to speak for a second. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> When I'm addressing this issue of uh, COVID relief, two things come to mind, timeliness and comprehensiveness. Because in a disaster like this, not only do we have to have the right level of assistance, but it also has to be done in a timely fashion. Otherwise, many, many people will die needlessly. We had that something similar to that here during Katrina. Um, and what I do believe, first of all, is that it is a mistake for Biden to send mm -hmm. his emergency proposals to Congress, because that is just time consuming, awkward for reasons that we've talked about. The reality is he could declare a national emergency. And if 400,000 dead is not a national emergency, I don't know what is. And he could introduce by way of executive order various uh, programs such as the uh, relief programs, such as the unemployment. Trump did this, by the way, you know, jacking up the unemployment to 400, finding the funds there for that. Uh, and for the other, the state emergency relief, uh, the 15% hazard pay, he could initiate a national state of emergency, declare it, and then use that as the justification for delivering uh, funding, certainly in a timely fashion, and that would save an enormous number of lives. We all know that Congress demonstrated last year that it is the last place on earth you want to put uh, a quest for emergency aid. Uh, because in, in a time of crisis, because it's failed that totally. So I think really a starting point for, for dealing with this crisis has to be saying to Biden, look, you know what's going to happen if you put it in Congress, and you know thousands and thousands of people are going to die. So you issue a declaration of emergency, issue the appropriate executive orders, and then you can fight it out with these guys in court. Trump fought it out in court over shifting two and a half billion from the uh, Pentagon over to build the border wall, and he won. Trump was also able to find a way to, for a few weeks anyways, jack up uh, the payments or give us $300 a week enhanced payments. And those were all based on emergency situations. We need to bring that whole idea of an emergency declaration to a qualitatively higher level if we want to avoid hundreds of thousands of additional deaths. That's where I come from, on, where I'm coming from on that. I don't think he would do that, though. <laughs> well, that's the problem, but we should demand that. Right. Mm -hmm. Because Congress is a cesspool. All right, it's, you know, it's even more so than the White House controlled by the oligarchs, which is part of the reason that they hate, hate Trump, because he's a nut. Um, but the reality is, it, Congress is not the place for emergency COVID relief decisions of a major to be decided that are of a pressing nature. But Mike, are you arguing that he could do everything that's included in this package by executive order? I mean, I don't know. That's what I'm arguing. He should try. I mean, there'll be a legal battle over it. But right, right, right. It's all right. Yeah, right, right. Trump, Trump was able to do it partially on a smaller scale. We want to take that advantage, take that precedent and demand it be put on a level that's appropriate for the level of crisis that the country is facing at this point. Right. That's what I'm saying. I know Ron Paul won't like it, but that's that's tough. Uh, well, if it's okay, can, can I make a couple comments then? I think that uh, what Mike raised I think that's absolutely brilliant. 
what you raised. And I, I, I 100% agree with you that we should be demanding, not that it uh, uh, go to uh, legislation, but that Trump, de that it's a national emergency. It's an emergency for a family to be sleeping in the street. It's an emergency for a parent not to be able to put food in the mouth of, of her or his children. It's an emergency in every way. And, and uh, uh, when they want to find money to drop bombs somewhere in the world, they can find the money for that on an emergency basis. Well, that's the truth. So, Always find mo uh, money to bomb and kill. And, yeah. Right. And, and so, and so this should, there should be an executive order. Now, it's virtually certain that the federal courts, especially now, but even before, would throw it out. And so that's where, I mean, what we should say is, look, if you had workers' representatives and a workers' representative as president, then they would just simply defy the courts. Trump has done it. Just defy the courts and, and tell them the hell with what you say. We're going to spend the money. Put me in prison if you like. And so uh, I, I think that we should absolutely have a campaign around that, like what, uh, what you propose, like in, in line with what you are suggesting, Mike. 